back when we had the fish by the abundance, we had one person that was a salmon chief, Kinkanahua, salmon chief at Kale Falls. And he's the one that watched the salmon. He's the one that kind of more or less in his own mind count. And he let the people know that, well, today and tonight, I want all of you to sweat all of you to go clean yourselves off because tomorrow morning we're going to start fishing. Even back then, they even separated a lot of their fish. This one wasn't ready yet to drop her egg, so they throw that one back. And the ones that they get that were soft and, and well, this one here will keep this one. When Cooley Dam went in, before that there was salmon. Um, my elders used to say the salmon was so thick you could walk across the river on their backs. Grand Coulee Dam blocked the, the run of salmon, so it took away the fisheries up the Kettle Falls. And when they put Chief Joseph Dam in, it took away another 54 miles of where the salmon ran that the tribe would fish on. Wells Dam inundated the last one of the last fisheries that the Cobble tribe was able to experience in a natural river. The inundation flooded out scaffold sites, or spearing sites, where the Kavul tribal members were able to harvest significant amounts of fish annually. I think the Colvilles wanted to move to selective fishing specifically because it was an opportunity for them uh, to harvest some fish. For us, it's about sustainability. The Selective Harvest Program represents a piece of our traditional thinking and knowledge to better manage our natural resources, that being the salmon. Almost all the species of salmon in their area are on the endangered species list. Those come with very strict legal requirements for just how many of those fish can be harvested. Using selective techniques allowed them to have a harvest on the abundant hatchery fish, and so it provided a, a huge opportunity for them. The types of gears we're, we're experimenting with now, the Colville's and the state of Washington, are, are looking at gears such as beach seines, where you encircle a school of fish with a net and pull them to shore. Uh, purse seines, which is the same thing as a beach sein, only you encircle the fish from a boat. Weirs across the river were traditionally used by Indians throughout the Northwest. Tangle net gear is, uh, is a net anywhere from 100 to 150 feet that an individual can put out himself, an individual tribal member, and the Colville Tribes Fish and Wildlife Department tested this up here, and we found that we were able to definitely get our hands on fish. And the beach saying you're using a river, smaller river setting, and you anchor it on the beach, and you pull it out with a boat, maybe you're able to corral these adults out in the river and bring them in and sort through them. In the planning stages right now, building a, a weir, okay, they've used them a long time ago long before I was born. And so the weir is going to be used to not only sort the, the natural origin from the hatchery fish, but also allows us to harvest any hatchery fish that come up through there. The other individual method that we're looking at is the scaffolds. With the scaffolds, we believe that we can use hoop nets, tangle net gear in there, we can use dip nets, and we want to try and see if we can release the wild fish through that type of method as well. I mean, I think the one that we've been very successful in has been the purse seine. The purse seine operation requires an investment. You know, I think we got some money invested into the boat we call the dream catcher. We got a 700 or 900 foot purse seine net, finer mesh so that we don't descale the fish. And we set that out in a U shape and we're able to close that up. And when the conditions are right, we're able to remove, you know, anywhere from 200 to 1500 fish in a setting and sort through those fish. The fish are gathered together while still alive and then gone through one at a time to determine whether or not it's a fish that you can keep or want to keep or a fish that you need to turn loose. Yeah, we, we catch uh, fish that need to be released. Uh, all we do is just take them out, put them back in the water and let them go. Wild release! The other active gear types, um, gill nets are a good example. You actually, the fish captures himself in the gear and then you bring in the gear. Unfortunately, in order to get the fish to capture themselves, they usually uh, 
exhausted or injured themselves in some way so that you really don't have a, a good opportunity to release that fish. And that's why a lot of us are talking about weirs, way of devices that will help catch hatchery fish and allow the release of uh, the wild fish in the river, right in the river itself. Prior to the salmon returning to the Colville Nation, they're harvested all the way from Alaska down through Canada and Washington. So about 50% of all the adult salmon are harvested before they even reach the Columbia River. And then there's another 50% of those that are harvested in the Columbia River. So there's only about 20, 30% that actually reach the Colville Nation's uh, traditional fishing area. In many cases, by the time the fish got back to the Colvilles, there were none left to harvest. Loss of habitat in all of its forms through grazing, logging, agriculture. The hydro system, particularly important in the Columbia River with nine main stem hydroelectric projects, harvesting and hatcheries. All of those were designed and built and have many beneficial uses. Unfortunately, when you combine the impacts of all of those onto a population like salmon, it's very difficult for them to maintain the, themselves in the face of all that. It's not many left to provide the next generation's run. So fish selectively, they need to protect those wild spotted fish and harvest the hatchery fish that are more abundant and are meant to be harvested. For those endangered species that are out there, we're trying to ensure that the genetically superior fish, that being the natural born fish, will continue on. The reason there's a need to protect wild fish is because they're locally adapted to the stream and environment that they grew up in. Every stream genetically is different because that group of fish is locally adapted. And it's that long-term adaptation that's important. And when hatchery fish spawn with wild fish, those genetics are disrupted because the hatchery fish are domesticated. When we first started doing this at the mouth of the Okanagan, sports fishermen were pretty angry because they weren't educated on what we we're doing and how we we're doing it. A lot of them have come around and understand. We've tried to reach out to the various Congress people, state reps, WDFW, to try to educate them so when they get inquiries from the general public about the Colville tribes doing mass commercial fishing at the mouth of the Okanagan, that's not the case. It's our selective harvest program. We have a set allocation on how much we can fish, and we're trying to fulfill that. But in the process, we're, we have this traditional thinking in mind that, okay, if we're gonna try to contribute to this overall cause to get some of these salmon off the endangered species list, what, what can we do to, to ensure that? And so our thought is release the native species, keep the hatchery fish, and do it that way. And that's the way we've done it. Wild release. Building back these stocks, doing the habitat restoration work, uh, completing our efforts on mass marking and selective fishing, getting the stray rate down, and then building support for a scientifically enlightened approach to this, moving away from tackle and gear that's indiscriminate and killing fish. All of those things are part of the solution. We're still, we're a long ways away from completing our, our ultimate goal of, of um, having all of this habitat restored. We can do everything right up here in the habitat, but we've got basically nine federal dams that the fish have to get through. We have a hatchery programs that are influencing the composition of the fish that are on the spawning grounds and whatnot. You know, we have, and we have harvest issues that, that we have to look at, and so all of these all of these issues uh, need attention and need to be coordinated in order to reach our ultimate goal. And for me, the ultimate goal is to get these fish where they can be delisted. Success looks to me like when we can restore these wild runs and build them back up, when we can have hatcheries that have uh, outstanding brood stock that you know, very, you know, produce wild fish and, and the closest thing to wild fish over the years. And also fixing these hatcheries so that the way they operate doesn't adversely affect wild fish. But with our, uh, our habitat restoration efforts, you've seen a lot more fish go up the Okanagan than you've ever seen, at least in anybody's lifetime that's alive today. We have fish going back up the Omak Creek, which has been over 70 years since we've had fish go back up Omak Creek, and we're doing the same thing with Salmon Creek, which has been longer. It's been over 100 years since salmon have returned to Salmon Creek. And that's not even on the reservation, but we're doing that because it's creating more habitat for the fish, which in the end is gonna create larger numbers coming back up the Columbia Main Stem and making it readily available to our members and to other sports fishermen as well. When we sit back and looked at 
selective harvest, we wanted to be able to provide opportunities for individuals, Cobble tribal members, that want to provide for their families. And then we wanted to be able to provide an opportunity for communal fishing, where we provide for those tribal members that aren't able to get out there and fish for themselves. Tribes come there from miles and miles around each year to be able to get their fish because that was part of their sustenance or part of their way of life. We're set up in a situation where the salmon can go no further than Chief Joe Dam. And so we got tribes above us that don't have access to fish. We fill our needs and then we share with our other our sister tribes that are you know, adjacent, or if it's Canada or the Spokanza, the Coeur d'Alene's or the Kalispells. We only do that because it's in line with our traditional ways. We've always done that. You look at Kettle Falls as a good example where we've always shared the fish. Any tribal people who showed up, they got their share. And for us, it's just st sticking with our, our traditional beliefs that we share, the, we share the natural resources, that being the salmon. And it's our way of sharing. And, you know, I'm just proud to say that we are living the old Indian way. And given that uh, salmon in the Pacific Northwest is what attracts a lot of people. We have an obligation to protect that. The Upper Columbia is so far ahead of everybody else in the state, and the state of Washington is, is light years ahead of everybody else in the United States as far as this, this whole process goes too. Growing up, the only place you could fish for salmon was at Chief Joseph Dam. Now that's increased. People are fishing on the Okanagan for salmon. It's because of the efforts the Cobble tribes have taken. You know, some of the steps we've taken with the habitat restoration all up the Okanagan. The Canadian tribes, our sister tribes, they now can fish salmon at Okanagan Falls where it hasn't been readily available for generations. Here they're working together for the betterment of the resource, all peoples, all cultures, and most importantly for the great-great-grandkids. I think all, all people will benefit from it, not just our own members, but the sports fishermen that come into our area. It's the right thing to do and everybody benefits and it helps the tribes too because the tribes can get can capture more hatchery fish. Hopefully in the future this thinking or this idea of selective harvest will create a, well, a larger yield of salmon for their future generations and that's ultimately our, our goal. In order to do that, um, you know, we need to work together as a, as a group to ensure that these runs continue and continue strong. You find these pieces of common ground when you've got disparate parties. And fishing is a great one because a lot of people like to fish. And there's a common ground right there. You know, we're looking into the future and making sure that, that, that um, future generations have fish to fish on. I hope someday that Kettle Falls is alive again. I want to get salmon above Chief Joseph. I want to get salmon above Grand Coulee Dam. That's my, my goal because that's going back to what we once had. We don't have that no more.